Welcome back to Rise and Grind. It is time for a special drop-in interview today. It is Thursday, so it's time to catch up with Teresa Walker, pro football writer for the Associated Press. Teresa, you made it through week one. It was a tough week one, but you made it. How you doing? Uh, I did fine. I'll just say this. It's funny. I I had people reaching out. I started my 25th season covering the NFL with this last weekend, right? And I shared that, and people were like, well, sorry you had such a bad game to cover. And it's like, well, here's the thing. When there's a blowout, it's not a bad thing. I mean, my story, I started writing in the second quarter, and my story (laughs) was polished. And as soon as it hit zeros, boom. So I don't mind those games. They're not as much fun for a season-long kind of period because, yeah, they get tiring. But on, on game day, it's what helped me. It's a, Guys, I've covered Vanderbilt football. This is my 30th season. Writing about the winner on game day has been a saving grace all those years. All right, so you don't mind it when it's a blowout uh, story-wise. Titans fans, we mind it. What happened with week one? I know in your latest piece you said it's no time for some excuses, but Teresa, I need something to hold on to. Like I need just give me something. I need do I do I take an excuse? Give me some positive news. What should I take from game one that could make me a, a smile a little bit going into week two? Well, there's a lot of excuses, and the funny thing is, Mike Vrabel said, "Listen, you can make excuses for everything." But the fact of the matter is they've got to play better, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge that they've got right now. Uh, This is a team that they didn't – this offense did not have a lot of time together in the preseason, right? Uh, You know, Julio Jones missed three weeks after coming down on a foot wrong, uh, like August 1st or 2nd. And then he gets back, and they practice two days. And then Ryan Tannehill goes on the reserve COVID list. They didn't get their starting center and right guard back until last Wednesday off of the reserve COVID list. So, you know, there's some, you know, they, as much as they tried to deny it, there was rust. And Mark Mary Annie, former receiver and, uh, you know, kick returner for this franchise, he pointed out on social media yesterday with a bunch of pictures that uh, the, the new offensive coordinator, Todd Downey, he had these guys bunched in. You know, instead of using Julio Jones and A.J. Brown spreading the field and, you know, they were up tight on the line, and, you know, call me crazy, I've never played in the NFL, but I've certainly watched it for, you know, several decades. And it's tough to find a lot of running room when you've got 300-pound guys. They're in the middle, and you've got your receivers, your tight ends, and everybody are just bunched there. And Mary Annie's suggestion was spread things out, which, call me crazy, makes a lot of sense. Now, there's been criticism of this first-time offensive coordinator. Uh, You know, they scored 13 points. Well, it turns out that dating back to 17, when he was the coordinator of the Oakland Raiders, he has a five-game stretch now of his offenses averaging 13 points a game. Now, take that for what it will. Now, the key is, what do they do to adjust it? Ryan Tannehill yesterday said they got kind of hit in the mouth and didn't really respond well. So, uh, you know, I'm Derek Henry was kind of fussing at guys on the sideline in that game. Something that for him is incredibly rare. So now you've got somebody who, you know, if, if, if I'm in that locker room and Derek Henry says something on the sideline, that's going to get my attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but it's about how do they respond. And A.J. Brown said yesterday he didn't want to talk about anybody but the receivers group, but he kind of agreed that, you know, a fast team did not play fast on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they can go faster in and out of the huddle. They can block better. They can push some people. They can, crazily enough, maybe adjust the play when there's a guy standing out there and nobody picks him up and you run a naked bootleg right into his arms for a sack. So, uh, you know, got to think that watching that film Monday was not easy because, This is an offense that was tied for second last year with 396.4 yards per game, fourth in the NFL, scoring 30.7 points a game. Uh, On paper, we've seen them be better. You know, four members of that offensive line are back. Uh, You can't tell me that Dennis Kelly makes that much of a difference at right tackle. Um, But, you know, they didn't play in the preseason. The, The starting offense did not play together in the preseason, in a preseason game. So, you know, how much of that was Ryan Tannehill going on the COVID list a few days, you know, that Thursday before the final preseason game? We don't know. They've now had their preseason game. It was ugly. And, you know, the one good thing about having 17 games this year is they now have 16 games left to make some fixes and look like the team that, well, not only we thought they'd look like, but they thought they'd look like. Mm -hmm. Now, Teresa, I have to ask one question coming off of that because there has been a lot of calling people out as you mentioned with the picture of the offensive coordinator and then you had Vrabel um, the day after calling out Julio Jones about that penalty in the locker room is that a good thing to have going into week two though 
Well, think about this, Megan. Don't you want everybody to be held accountable to the same level? And that's what Mike Vrabel did on Monday. You know, and and he has talked before about not doing dumb and I'm going to paraphrase stuff to hurt the team. And he called what Julio Jones did a critical mistake. Think about this unnecessary roughness penalty. The whistle's blown and he keeps blocking downfield. And then he shoves the guy in the face. You know, some refs could have looked at that and said, you know what, you're out of here. Uh, they didn't. They just gave him an unnecessary roughness penalty that wiped out a seven yard gain by Derrick Henry, turned third and one into third and 16 for a team that was trying to find something to start getting some rhythm going. And that was just like dropping a rock on your head. So, uh, you know, here's the thing. Derrick Henry, uh, it kind of helped set that tone in that locker room. And, and Julio Jones is from Alabama as well. And he's praised how that is kind of a you know, college atmosphere in that locker room. When I hear Mike Vrabel say that, some people outside are probably thinking, wait, what? But here's the thing. He is holding everybody accountable. If I'm the 53rd guy on the roster and Julio Jones got called out by the head coach in front of everybody, that's telling me I better be on my P's and Q's because nobody is above criticism. Okay. Yeah, and I actually even appreciated like Taylor Luan hopping on Twitter and flat out saying he got his butt kicked and got exposed by Chandler Jones. I think at least there was some self-accountability, self-reflection going on. Teresa, I'm curious from your standpoint on the defensive side of things, when you look at a Titans team that gave up 38 points to the Arizona Cardinals, were you more concerned with the Titans defense or more impressed with Kyler Murray and what they've got going there in Arizona this season? Tough not to be impressed with Kyler Murray, right? I mean, that kid, you know, he did some things. This is just the start of his third year. And uh, Next Gen Stats came out yesterday, like he ran around on that one completion, uh, you know, ran around like 43 yards or something. I mean, it was just insane. And it was one of the biggest scrambles. I mean, we've gotten so used to Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson. Well, what he did ranks up there over a few years. I mean, he's, he ran around. And, you know, the Titans, they did get two sacks. Uh, the problem is, you know, he kept running around. And this is an area that we thought this team was so much better on third down. They they were the best defense in yards allowed, fewest yards allowed, and fewest passing yards allowed in the preseason, which just goes to show you the preseason stats don't mean much, right? Um, they were 7 of 13 on third down the other day, which was an area that was absolutely a area of focus for improvement. And, and uh, they did not do well. And the problem is that, you know, part of it, Jack Rabbit Jenkins, one of the veterans they signed, you know, he apparently had the wrong shoes on. He slipped a couple times, uh, got flat out beaten by DeAndre Hopkins a few other times. And, you know, he's a guy who has to be better. It, 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 the good thing is that Christian Fulton, the second year cornerback, second round pick out of LSU, he had a really good game, uh, led the team in pass breakups with two. Had a, you know, he just had, you know, Mike Vrabel is saying, I can't wait to watch this guy play football the rest of the year. Now, the problem is they need Caleb Farley, their first round pick this year, to be available sooner rather than later. He got in that game, but he's now in the injury report with a shoulder injury. So, uh, you know, the future's looking brighter for some of those defenders. But, uh, yeah, they've got some areas that they absolutely need to clean up. They need to be a little bit more maybe disciplined in their pass rush because they're going to face another guy on Sunday in Russell Wilson who can run around and buy time to find a receiver down the field, and they better stay in their rush gaps. They better help keep them contained and, and, and try to – they've got to play better defense. I mean, the, now the offense put them in some bad situations. You know, they did force uh, uh, Arizona to a field goal the other day, right? Um, but, you know, when they were backed up after a turnover, problem is, you know, Kyler Murray, DeAndre Hopkins, A.J. Green, they've got some good players over there. In fact, most NFL play teams do have good players, and this defense has got to play better. Yeah, as you, as you mentioned, they got to play better because they have the Seattle Seahawks, who also had a great week one. And you have to go to Seattle. You're coming off of a loss where your fans started to boo you and left early. Now you're going to a place called in Seattle where it gets loud. It's hard to hear. You have Russell Wilson. When you see this defense and what they have to do, what's your expectations going into week two? Well, I'm expecting the Titans to be better. Now, the problem is they can be better and still lose because, again, they're going to Seattle, a good team that just beat Indianapolis, which thank you for that, you know, if you're an AFC South team. But on the other side, they've got to go out there and try to get a win in a place that, you know, they won in 2009 when C.J., Chris Johnson, you know, finished off his 2,000-yard season. But Seattle has been kind of a house of horrors for the Tennessee Titans. So the fact that they're coming off a stinker, 
having been routed, dominated, whatever word you want to use, uh, maybe that plays in their favor. Because while they can talk about flushing it, you know, we're over it. We spent Monday and Tuesday on it. Now we're focused on Seattle. You're not human if you're not in the back of your head thinking, yeah, I can't wait to go show what I actually can do as an NFL player. I mean, when I struggle on a, a game day story or something, I can't wait for the next game so I can be better. Uh, if you're human, uh, I, how is that not some bit of motivation? So maybe that's the thing that can help them push past that edge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another NFC West opponent in those Seahawks. Mm-hmm. And the NFC West was one of the most impressive divisions. Week one will be most likely one of the most competitive divisions this season. When it comes to the AFC South, though, and as the Titans try to rebound, and again, it's only week two, but in terms of week one, is the Houston Texans the only member of that division to get a win? Teresa, how do you measure the AFC South after week one? What's your hottest of hot takes coming into this week? <laughs> well, uh, Jacksonville is who we thought they were, and Houston is lucky that they played Jacksonville in the opening week. So, uh, yeah. you know, the Colts, uh, I, I still need to see more about Carson Wentz. I, I, I'm, st- I'm still not sold on him. I'm sorry. Uh, and with him being unvaccinated still, it just feels like in a 17-game season, that's something that could come back to bite them in this season. Uh, you know, one of the lowest teams in vaccination rates, right? So, you know, it, the, the Colts had to play the Seattle Seahawks. The t- Titans had to play Arizona to open this week. All of the AFC South is playing the NFC West, though, so everything will even out. It's a one-week bump. Don't panic about it too much, but uh, you know if the Colts and the Titans do want to be competing for the division title. They better get right sooner than later. Oh, anytime I hear "don't panic," that's you when panic. I start panicking, <laughs> Teresa. That's when I start <laughs> panicking. Uh, speaking of panicking, uh, another teams uh, that in the over in the SEC, you cover Vanderbilt, you cover UT Vols. A lot of panic is probably happening. B- Vanderbilt, they know it very well. UT, they know it very well. But this is like no other. I talked to a couple of my friends from UT. I follow them on Twitter. They're very, very upset after the loss against Pitt. And now you're looking at the SEC schedule. It's looming. It's right around the corner from the SEC matchups. How do you, where do you see Vanderbilt kind of potentially playing out and UT playing out? (laughs) Well, Clark Lee is an alum. He understands the challenge that he has at Vanderbilt, rebuilding that program. And, you know, he, he said Tuesday to us that, you know, they're playing Stanford on Saturday night. And for many, many years i've heard you know vanderbilt people saying well we need to be like stanford or northwestern mm-hmm. or you know wake forest even and you know clark lee's like well that's fine and they're great you know stanford's a great institution a lot of admiration for david shaw but we're vanderbilt in the sec and being in the sec is an advantage that none of these other private institutions have and he wants to be able to take advantage of that and be able to compete in this league which will give them a higher ceiling. Unfortunately, he walks into a program that, you know, well, until they won on Saturday night in Colorado State, they'd lost 11 straight games. Uh, you know, their their SEC skid is like 13. So, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, this is not going to be an overnight turnaround, okay? Unfortunately, with all the opt-outs last year and all the transfer portal situation, you know, we talk about it with Tennessee, but Vanderbilt got hit as well. Uh, he, you know, he's having to play catch up. This is going to be a longer term rebuilding project. Now, Tennessee, you know, Lord, you know, you look at the numbers of the players who've left that fran- that roster over the last year, not just since, you know, December when the season ended, but since last September. And you look at Henry Toa Toa, he's, you know, tied for the league in tackles at, at Alabama. That hurts. But uh, I think the thing that Vols fans are most upset about is, well, we thought Joe Milton, great arm doesn't matter how strong your arm is if you keep overthrowing your receivers. Teresa, no, uh, listen, wait, oh, wait. I was a, I'm was a Michigan fan, watched Joe Milton all of last year, and I was trying to tell people he's got a cannon, but he's going to use it. There is no, like, light throw from Joe Milton. He's throwing it 100 miles an hour at your head, and he's going to throw it 100 miles an hour over your head, man. He's got to get some touch. Somebody get that boy some touch, please. CJ, CJ, you're completely right. It doesn't matter if you've got a Porsche or a Ferrari if you're having to drive in the school zone. You've got to find the place. You've got to be able to fit that ball in. His job is to put the ball in the receiver's hands. And when you overthrow him by 5, 10 yards, it does nothing. Now, you know, last year I know he dealt with a thumb injury on his throwing hand. Well, he seems to be healthy except for the leg injury that has him kind of maybe maybe questionable for Saturday. Uh, you know, Josh Heupel isn't saying anything right now. He's 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 not seeing this as you know quarterback controversy or you know adversity or something. He's looking at something that they can improve on. 
And, you know, Hendon Hooker looked pretty good. I mean, he moved this team. He put the ball in the receiver's hands, which is a good thing. Uh, he can run as well. I know there are Tennessee fans. Well, wait a minute. Let's go back to Harrison Bailey. Calm down. Pump the brakes. You know, you've got to develop a quarterback here, okay? Both Hooker, both Milton have some availability. This isn't a one-year and gone deal. So you want to try to develop a guy who might actually be here next year. You know, get some continuity. You know, playing quarterback roulette and going through the revolving door week after week, game after game, quarter after quarter does not help a program that is trying to, you know, stick a, stick a shovel in the ground, so to speak, and stop the skid this program has been on for the last couple of years. You know, if you want to start building and going in the right direction in this new tenure with this new coach, then you've got to stick with one quarterback if at all possible. Yeah, and if you're Memphis, it makes you feel incredibly grateful for what you've seen thus far from Seth Hennigan as a true freshman. And when you have that quarterback position figured out, it makes things at least fall into place a little bit easier. Teresa, I wanted to get your take on one thing. We talked about it in our last segment, but the Milwaukee Bucks hiring Lisa Byington as their new lead play-by-play -play voice for their television broadcast. You do so much work with the Association of Women in Sports Media. She is the first woman to have this kind of position in the NBA. Just what does it mean to the industry as a whole to see a hire like this made? It's tremendous. I mean, we've seen Doris Burke and, you know, so many women that have been doing TV, uh, you know, for, for networks. But to now see uh, this happen, it, it just feels like yet another area that we can go into. And I'll say this, I'm looking forward to the day where we don't do stories. First woman referee, first woman this, first woman that. Uh, you know, it's kind of like Monday night, you know, Carl, and I'm going to butcher his name, Carl Nassib, or Nassib, you know, the first openly gay player in the NFL. I think the best thing will be when we get to a point where it's like, oh, so-and-so got hired. Oh, that's cool. And then just go on with our day. But it's great to see the opportunities that are happening. And, I, you know, I'll probably turn in, and I won't be the only woman who turns in for maybe at least one Bucks game this year just to, just to listen to her and, you know, give her kind of that little silent push and support. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. We're super excited for Lisa. And Lisa joins an amazing crew already. She's got Zora Stevenson, too. So two women who are trailblazing and leading the way um, for us all in the sports world. Teresa, before I let you go, I got to ask you what it, who wore your best look at the Met Gala? Because you DM'd me about the Met Gala and the theme. Did you have a favorite look? Well, Dan Levy's, uh costume, I mean, his outfit, it, it, it's like, okay, I'm looking at it and it's like, okay, what does it mean? It has mm -hmm. to mean something, right? Uh, the, the best thing was what I shared with you on Twitter was the look at, you know, comparing them to, you know, to, to beverages, you know, to <laughs> seltzers and stuff. And, and was it, was it, uh, oh, I can't remember the name, but the person who had like the ample mousse type seltzer, that gallon, that was, you know, all laid out. That was pretty special. So I do like to see what they wear at the Met Gala. I'll, I'll say this. Maybe I'm a little bit more in tune to it after watching the movie Ocean's 8. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, you know, yes, when I watch the Met Gala or watch the outfits coming up the uh, stairs there at the Met Gala, I always think of that movie. I mean, <laughs> Rihanna was late the other night, but it's like she's been there. She was in the movie. <laughs> She's true. She's true. She was in the movie. Ocean's 8 is a movie. I haven't seen that movie in a long time. And I forgot that it, the Met Gala was incorporated yeah. into their whole entire scheme of the diamond. The diamond. Yes. Go watch it again. Ocean's movies. I will. Definitely will. Probably maybe today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see how that goes. Teresa, we know you have another busy week ahead, so we appreciate you joining us. And we'll catch up with you again soon. Hopefully, for Megan's sake, we'll be talking about a Titans win next time around. Maybe two Titans wins next <laughs> time around. We're playing Seattle. We're playing Seattle. I know. I know what Teresa said. I love what Teresa said. She was like, you can get better. And, and not, not win. win. I'm going to go with that. I'm, I took that as that. We can get better and still not win. <laughs> Vanderbilt's been getting better every yeah, year. Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> not really, CJ. Not, not so really. Much. <laughs> Teresa, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. <laughs> thank you, Bob. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye, Teresa. Ooh, we can get better and not win, Megan. Don't, don't put yourself in the Vanderbilt it. category. We can get better and not win. We can get better and not win. Take that. I would, yeah, I'm with Teresa. I just want to see some improvement. Mantra. Especially. Uh, I think I want to see more improvement on offense than I do on, on defense. At this point, like defense, we always struggle struggle defensively. Offensively, like I don't need that to be a problem. We have way too many weapons. Ryan Tannehill, when you were at, I think it was like, well, they were at the 5-10 yard line, and it was like first and goal, and they had so many opportunities. Julio Jones dropped the pass, Derrick Henry, they, they like stuffed Derrick Henry at, at some point. I just need, a, need us, when we get into that red zone, 
We gotta be able to score. Yeah, we got it down on the third down when Ryan Tannehill had a, like a you know an open way. But we, we we have way too much going on offensively. I need to see improvements, and it's gonna be difficult. I, I love Russell Wilson, but I will still cheer for the Titans. But just have it be a shootout. Yeah, I'm fine with that. And I'll keep I thinking about Wilson. Sierra's outfit too, probably the whole entire time. I'm like, I wonder if she's wearing that same dress <laughs> while she's sitting there. Watching. Will she ever put that dress on again is the real question. That's going to be, that's that's a dress you keep and don't give back to the designer because you're going to give it to your daughter. Okay. Like that's why, because she talks about how Sienna, her daughter, is a huge fashion diva already at such a young age. That's a dress you're going to keep and say, that's her dad. Wear that number on the chest. And she's probably going to have a Super Bowl ring too, wearing it as well. I can't wait. Keep the good ones like mm -hmm. that. Those are nice little vintage pieces for children to have. All right, we'll take a quick break. We have CJ's Corner still ahead. We have Pop of the Morning, all that and more on Rising Grind.